Let us bow our heads and begin with a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Be of good heart, son. Thy sins are forgiven thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Although the man in today's gospel came to our Lord wanting to walk again, our Lord tells him to be of good heart. Not because he was cured and now he's able to walk again, but because he had his sins forgiven. Well, the soul rates higher than the body. Now, of course, that's a no-brainer for us anyway. But St. Uh, Thomas even says that the body exists for the sake of the soul. So the soul has priority. So when something affects the soul, then... Somehow it's going to affect the body. Now this is the mystery of sin, and it's proven by Scripture. Well, first sin of Adam and Eve caused death and sickness to enter into the world. Sin which damages the soul, then also damages the body as a result of this. Now St. Jerome draws this parallel when he comments on today's Gospel. And he says the following. He says, quote, Because his sins are forgiven by which we are given to understand that many bodily infirmities befall us because of sin, and therefore perhaps his sins were first forgiven, that the cause of his infirmity, his sickness, be removed, and his health might be restored. Close quote, St. Jerome. So here in today's Gospel, the men lower the paralytic so that our Lord can heal his body, but he first cures his soul. Our Lord forgives his sins, and so his soul is restored first because it's more important than his body. And then he cures the body. Now this past Friday, which was Ember Friday, we read the gospel account of St. Mary Magdalene, who went in weeping at our Lord's feet, washing his feet with her tears, and then drying his feet with her hair. Now this is a tremendous act of sorrow and contrition for her sins. But the Pharisees, seeing this, said within themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also when he forgave the man's sins in today's gospel? Just like today's gospel too, the scribes said, some of the scribes said within themselves, he blasphemes. Now it's obvious to all of us that we literally, or we can't literally see that sins are being forgiven, but you can definitely see a paralytic walk. Now you can't see something supernatural, but we can see something natural. Now, the thing that's supernatural requires a greater power, while the natural requires less, even though here we're talking about a miracle in both cases, the supernatural miracle, the forgiveness of sins, and the miracle on the level of nature, which is making a paralytic walk. So our Lord shows him then by a miracle performed on the natural order that he has the power to forgive sins, that is, perform a miracle on the supernatural order. If he's God, he can do one, he can do the other. But our Lord wanted to show us. And for this reason, St. John Chrysostom says the following. He says, The more the soul is greater than the body, the greater is it to forgive sin than to heal the body. But because the former is not visible, and the latter is, he does what is lesser but more evident to prove something greater but less evident. In other words, it's pretty hard to prove that someone's sins are forgiven because he can't see it happen. But in order for our Lord to show them that something that they can't see has happened, like the forgiveness of sins, he performs this miracle and shows them something that they can see. And so he tells a paralytic, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And then Scripture continues and says, And he arose and went into his house. So we see that a miracle has truly happened here. But here the multitude, even seeing this, feared, that's what Scripture tells us, and glorified God that he gave such power to men. Now we can ask the question, well, which power? That of forgiving sins or that of making the lame man walk? Well, those who have the greater power of faith see the greater power of forgiving sins and don't question it. But those with no faith or a weaker faith, they only see the natural miracle. But the power to forgive is actually a greater miracle. This also applies to us. It's not just to our Lord. If we forgive somebody who's wronged us, 
that actually takes more grace than to cure someone who's injured. It requires more grace because it's supernatural. Now, every time we go to confession with true sorrow and a firm purpose of amendment, and the priest pronounces the words, I absolve you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. With this, a greater miracle has taken place than making a lame man walk. Now, do we really see this when this happens? Do we really take advantage of the confession and say, you know, there's a great miracle that's about to happen in this confessional when I walk in there. When I walk out, these sins will not exist. This has greater power than making a lame man walk. That's how powerful the forgiveness of sins is. Do we ever think about that? This is the tremendous power of the sacrament of confession. Now in today's gospel, God is making an end to the infirmity or sickness of the soul by showing us how he put an end to the sickness that is caused in the body. Now, sin is a sickness in the soul that does actually cause a sickness in the body. We see that in in sacred scripture when we see Adam and Eve, that through their sin, death and sickness entered into the world. The reason for this is because sin is disobedience to God's law. And sin causes an unrest in the soul, and so the soul loses its peace because it's changed the order that God instituted in the world through more morality, and we've also changed the order of nature. Now, when a a person commits sin, the person is seeking something that will bring him pleasure or some benefit outside of God's laws and outside of God's proper order. Now, St. Thomas tells us that we never seek evil for the sake of evil. In other words, we're not looking at something to do something because, oh, yeah, this is evil, I'm going to go ahead and do it. But we seek evil because we perceive it as a good. Even though it is something evil in in itself, we perceive it as a good. Now, it's only an apparent good, which means it only appears as good. And I'll give an example. A child who is going to take a cookie from a cookie jar against his parents' wishes is actually doing something evil. Now, the evil isn't in the cookie. You could say, oh, Father thinks cookies are evil. Well, that's not what I think at all. But in this case, because of the very fact that a child's been told not to do it, The very fact that he's going for it makes this act an evil act. And so the child is doing something evil, not because of the cookie, but because of his action. Now the child is seeking what he knows will bring him his own good, a simple pleasure. But this, however, disobedience, the child may know that it's disobedience, but he doesn't stop doing it, he doesn't stop going for that cookie, because to him, to him, this good is far above the greater good of obedience. But, of course, after he gets spanked, he ends up in remorse and sadness. But for us, when we get older, this doesn't change much, but we feel it in a different way. Now, once we reach the age of reason, we understand remorse for a disordered action, and we feel bad because we've done something wrong. Now, this is something that does affect us, not only spiritually, but also bodily as well. We do feel that sadness. We do feel that depression when we've done something wrong. Now, as time goes on, if we've been doing, getting into bad habits and continually doing the wrong things, never going to confession, never seeking God's forgiveness, then we start to experience guilt and sadness, which eventually turns to depression and despair. But this is obviously something very common in this present day. Now, there's so many psychologists out there trying to excuse sin and disorder and trying to write it off as, you know, quote, somebody else's fault or trying to justify somebody's fault uh, by telling them, well, you know, you really didn't do this and actually this bad thing that you did is actually good, etc., etc. This is what psychology is all about. But this goes nowhere because a person will never right his wrongs. This eventually leads to depression because we can't write off our own consciences. Now, I just read on, uh, on Friday about uh, depressive uh, disorders. Now, I'm not looking to go into the psychological field, but it was uh, for the particular purpose of, uh, of just going in uh, to, see, to see this because it is something that's on, on the rise. And uh, depressive disorders affect approximately 18.8 uh, million American adults or about 9.5 of the U.S. population 18 or older. Now, one of the things that they wrote in this article is depression is one of the greatest problems and killers of our times. I think, well, why killers? Well, first of all, stress affects the human, the, the human being, the psyche, and also the heart. And uh, so there's an increase of heart disease, too, as a result of this. And doctors equate it to an increase in stress. 
But also su- suicide is on the rise, and this is a result of going into despair. Suicide is a, is a direct, co- is a direct uh, result of despair, and this is clear even by moral theology and also by uh, natural medicine and, and uh, doctors. Antidepressants are constantly being prescribed by doctors and psychiatrists alike, and this is on the rise, and we see more and more of this uh, in the world. Now, there's a the priest I know who is also a psychologist, and uh, he has gone into in, uh, insane asylums and started seeing that the cause of insanity is not so much, uh, I mean, there, there are disorders there, but the disorders, mostly depression, are on account of moral problems in life, such as sin, that they were somehow trying to excuse. And so this priest went in there and started hearing people's confessions, started blessing them. And all of a sudden, they started to change their lives around, and many of them were actually left and were, were cured of their their insanity, which to, at first was deemed incurable when they went in. Because we start seeing that there is an effect of this, and these things do affect uh, a person's natural life. This is why we have today's gospel, our Lord curing the man, curing the man and curing him of his sins, because the ailments of the body follow from the ailments of, uh, of morality, because we're changing God's order. Now we could say and look at this and say, well, what's the answer to all of this? Well, last week we spoke on joy. And this week we hear our Lord's words. Be of good heart, son. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. The right order of conscience is what brings us peace. When everything is right with God, well, then we're definitely and certainly at peace. Because he's the one that judges everything correctly. It doesn't matter what other people are saying about us, whether there's false accusations, stuff like that. Who cares? What people say is what people say, but it's what God judges in the end that's what's important. It's how God sees us. In fact, St. Francis de Sales used to say, you know, what does it matter what creatures think about me? It's what God thinks that matters. So right order of conscience is what brings us peace. Now, I've certainly seen this on men who are about to die. Suddenly they begin to worry about their judgment uh, before God right when they're going to die. But once they make a good confession with complete truthfulness, with true sorrow, with true contrition and a true repentance, they become more peaceful because they know that everything is in right order with God when they're about to, to meet him. Now admitting one's faults and owning, up, owning what, up to what we've done wrong gives us a peace because this very act is based on humility. Like, yeah, I did that wrong. You know, who cares? And who cares what people say? If we, if we own up to what's wrong, then it actually gives us greater credibility because we're willing to be, um, to be honest and admit certain things. But it brings us to a certain level of humility because what humility is is truth. Now, the one line that I want to emphasize again in today's gospel is to be of good heart. Now, when we have true humility and true contrition, we'll find this peace. This is why the Psalms tell us A contrite and humble heart, O Lord, thou wilt not despise. Our Lord is trying to heal us entirely from our fallen nature, both from original sin and from our actual sins, both naturally and supernaturally. He wants us to be at peace, and he wants us to be of good heart. Without this interior peace, we will have a tough time growing in virtue. A good, humble confession and a heartfelt sorrow will give us this peace. Be of good heart, son. Thy sins are forgiven thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.